Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks so much for being on the show. Do you want to start by telling our listeners about your background and what you're up to these days? I spent 10 years as a programmer before moving into the broad area of research. For the last year, I've been working on a project originally to figure out how to learn a new field without undue deference to credentialed authority, and now looking at what sort of emotional and psychological processes inhibit learning and how can we overcome them. How did you make that transition from how do I learn a field effectively to emotional and psychological blockers? Emotional and psychological blockers to progress is a concept that's in the water supply in my social sphere. But basically, I was teaching myself new things, and I noticed like I would hit blocks, and then in what I thought was a completely unrelated event, do a bunch of psychological work, and then suddenly I was able to learn the thing again. And I repeated this enough times that it just seemed like a pattern. And then once I started looking for it, there's actually a fair amount of research to support this decided that was the more important thing. One of the things I'm doing right now is essentially coaching individuals to remove their emotional and psychological blocks, which is you know beneficial for them. They meet their goals faster, but also beneficial for me in that I'm learning what kinds of things help people do that. And my goal is learn more about that and then buy it to more people. What are some of the specific blockers that you've seen? One major thing I mostly overcame was a belief that I have to believe what a book says and disagreeing with it or even choosing which book to believe is wrong. The progress forward was in letting me just put down a book and not feel bad about it without having to make a federal case out of it. Another example, and this is one I haven't overcome, is fear of looking stupid in front of other people. What is it that gives books such authority? I've spent a lot of time thinking about the education system, and I think this is really drilled in. Kids are not encouraged or allowed to do critical thought or pursue their own interests. School is a place where you are told what the goal is, how to meet the goal, and if you have met the goal, if you start arguing with the book, which is actually one of the best learning experiences a child could have, it's shamed almost. And in my case, it was at certain points pretty important that teachers like me for like physical safety reasons. So I think I developed an inhibition against challenging what I was being taught. Thanks for sharing that. I'm so sorry to hear that that was your experience, but very glad to hear that you were able to introspect on that. My expectation is in a year, I'll do another round of this and it will get even better. I don't think it's solved, but I, I certainly made significant progress. So I strongly agree that arguing with a book, really dissecting it, challenging everything that the book says, it's a very effective way to get the most out of a book. How would you restructure childhood education to make this more common or more prevalent or more encouraged? If you look at babies, they're doing exactly the right thing. They're pursuing their own goals and figuring out how to learn all on their own. Mostly their adults just need to get out of the way. Maybe they can offer like, a little encouragement or facilitation. And I just want to extend that period as long as possible, where kids are following their own interests and all adults are doing is helping them around the edges and facilitating their own curiosity. Could we extend that indefinitely? When you're following your curiosity, it's not always obvious what you should do. There is definitely a place for adults who has earned your trust and has the expertise to tell you hey, they'll have a much easier time with physics and rocketry if you learn some calculus, and I can help you do that. That trust has to be earned. Yeah. Children and teenagers are expected to sort of defer to adults who have not made any effort to earn their respect at all. And just the mindset of children are allowed to choose what they do, and if adults want to have influence, they have to earn it, would be a big improvement. So I think it starts with Give the child space to choose what they want. Offer them support. Kids will notice that the support you are providing is making it easier to reach their goals. Over time, they will trust you with bigger and bigger leaps before your advice starts to pay off. You wrote several thoroughly researched pieces, one of them about burnout, one of them about the oil crisis. Can you give a quick overview of what you were looking to accomplish with your oil crisis piece? Near the beginning of COVID, I wanted to figure out what was going to happen economically. 
I wanted to study other economic crises that had been caused by production problems. And the only example I could find was the 73 and possibly 79 oil crises in which another major input to production, oil, was suddenly cut off. What was your main takeaway from researching and writing that piece? Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yes. Okay. My main takeaway was, yep, everything is economic fuckery and not physical problems. The oil crisis was not actually a good example of a supply shock. The most immediate, obvious cause is the Bretton Woods Accords, where America went off the gold standard, which torched the price of oil as denominated in gold while keeping it pretty similar in dollars. The gold value of oil takes a huge dip and then returns to historical norms during the crisis. It only looks like a sudden run-up in prices if you have it denominated in American dollars. COVID is kind of unique among economic crises in that there's a genuine supply shock to labor. Trying to figure out who caused the crisis or what caused the crisis is like trying to figure out what caused a plane to crash. The most immediate answer is gravity, but that's not the interesting answer. It is appropriate for when there is a massive plague the supply of labor to go down. A very convincing YouTube video said, if we had had enough economic resilience, if people hadn't been so overextended, this wouldn't have been such a big deal. It's very easy to say, be less leveraged, be less lean, but all the economic pressures were pushing people to be more leveraged and more lean, and I don't have a simple answer for how to change that. What's the process like for investigating and writing a piece like that? the formal process I use to investigate, starts with coming up with a major question I wanted to answer, breaking it into smaller questions until they were down to almost atomic, looking for answers to those atomic questions and bubbling that up back to the major question. The burnout piece, which is much longer ago and actually triggered some soul searching about what I thought research should look like, the process was pretty much do a Google Scholar search, read what comes up, refine the process until I find the terms of art, read those papers, maybe read what they refer to. But I look back and I cringe a lot because I did not have the time to do a really deep dive into the quality of the experiments that were being done. I was mostly reading abstracts and taking the paper's word for it. That piece was commissioned. I only had so much time and there was a lot they want covered. But I almost won't do those kinds of pieces now because all I'm doing is reporting what someone else thinks. I'm not able to do the deep dives that tell you what actually happened. And I just hate taking authors' words for things. If you did have time to follow up, what would that look like? Read the experiment, eyeball the statistics for obvious things like a small sample size, a very small effect size, but also look at the experimental setup and see if it can even prove what they're claiming. In social science experiments, this often looks like, oh, this study does not say who it was done on, which means it was done on 19-year-olds trying to get 20 bucks, and therefore it's anyone's guess how applicable it is to the rest of the world. I was trying to investigate the claim that humans can do four hours of thought work in a day, and when I drilled down into the studies that was based on Almost all of them were about menial work, like memorizing words or doing very simple math or just things that had no applicability to anyone's ability to do creative or flow work for multiple hours. So those experiments couldn't possibly even inform the answer. It also reminds me of the willpower depletion idea. These sorts of studies seem to have such a grasp on our collective way of thinking about popular psychology. We take them so seriously. Carol Dweck and Angela Duckworth, who did Mindset and Grit, respectively, they get huge effect sizes from very short, like half-hour interventions. Anything that can be done in half an hour can be undone in half an hour. That has to be your starting assumption. And so I just don't believe you can get the impact, they say, from the interventions they suggest. I don't think there's a substitute to reading deeply and coming to your own conclusion. Were the experiments they ran correct? Are the experiments they cite from other papers correct? And you sometimes have to chase down like three or four papers deep to figure that out. 
over time, you can come to trust certain sources uh, and not have to do so much work to verify them. But it takes a very long time. And if you keep topic hopping the way I do, you kind of never hit critical mass on that. Education and encouraging children and supporting children in following their own curiosities will over time produce some movement towards the idea that you need to verify before you trust. But that's a very long-term project. How is the verification that you've been describing so far different from what you might call fact-checking? Especially when I first started, I would fall into this trap of just checking factual claims. What I realized over time was that was actually giving the author a tremendous amount of power. Uh, A particular example of this would be in the book Unbound Prometheus. There was a claim that Europeans were more rational than Asians during the Industrial Revolution and you can tell because their birth rates were lower. And when I researched this, I got really sucked into, is the claim that Europeans have a lower birth number true? And that turned out to be really complicated based on whether you defined it per person or per marriage and what counted as a birth. But that was actually all irrelevant because the idea that having fewer children proves you are more rational was completely unproven. How many children it is rational to have depends a lot on your circumstances. I've read other books suggesting that difference in agriculture between Europe and Asia led to very different child rearing patterns being the most economically efficient. And I feel really stupid for having spent that much time investigating a factual claim when the model that rested on top of it was so obviously wrong. Facts can serve as traps where you get sucked into verifying whether the fact is correct or not, but you don't think about, even if the fact is correct, what does that tell us? There's an additional problem where it's actually pretty easy to lie with the truth. If all you do is verify what someone has told you and not go looking for countervailing narratives or evidence that changes the meaning of what they presented, it's very easy to end up agreeing with someone who is definitely trying to mislead you because you didn't ask the right questions. And this is why I think it's so important to start with a question you want to answer rather than say a book you want to read and know it's correct. Because saying I want to know if this book is correct is already ceding much too much power to the author. Do you have a favorite example of misleading someone with the truth? My statistician father taught me this when I was like eight. So they asked heart attack survivors whether they drank coffee or not. It turned out they drank coffee at a much higher rate than the general population. And you could actually use that to claim either coffee is bad for you, it gives you heart attacks, or coffee is good for you, it helps you survive heart attacks. It turns out the answer is neither. Coffee drinkers are more likely to smoke cigarettes at the time. That's such a great example. It sounds like statistical discipline and a basic understanding of various misleading ways to use statistics would go a long way in avoiding these sort of traps. Yeah. I'm getting this image of a new profession. A few specialists who are well-trained in good research methodology, good statistics, and so forth, who are consulted whenever a difficult question needs to be asked, an important decision needs to be made. To what extent do you think there's a need for such a profession? I feel like such a profession would be a band-aid. My question for you would be, who is asking those questions, and why can't they be good at figuring out true things and acting on them? I don't want being right to be this sort of monastic tradition that gets consulted. I want that to be integrated into what everyone is doing all the time. I really like that. You introduced a process that you called knowledge bootstrapping. Can you describe the goal of this process? The goal is to turn some question into an answer you are confident in or at least know the correct confidence level in without deference to credentialed authority. Basically, I don't trust the credentialing authorities anymore to tell me who actually knows what is correct. And so I wanted a process that didn't depend on believing any one person or in fact, any people. Would you mind summarizing the core steps? Oh, I really wanna make people read the blog post, but it's basically figure out your question, break down the question, Write out what things you already know on the topic. Take notes, synthesize them in Rome, and then percolate your answers up. Yeah, so I would say it starts top down 
and then you work your way from the bottom back up. For me, this is about clearing out everything in my head so my brain doesn't keep bringing it up every time I read a new sentence. For someone else who tried the process, it was about bringing things into context so he could connect what he learned in the reading with what he already knew. And yes, this is extremely time consuming. What sort of process or technological improvements would shorten the research process without sacrificing critical thinking? Oh, that's a really good question. I love Rome research. Beyond that, my dream is I look at a study and then am instantly linked to attempts to replicate that study and whether they were favorable or unfavorable. It's not a total replacement for my own judgment. Most of what I think things will do is weed out bad apples faster. Having tried the process myself, I would definitely recommend giving it a shot. Please read my steps, try them, and then report back on how they work for you. As far as I know, everyone has been glad they tried it and felt they learned things from the process, even if they weren't inspired to go make this their whole life. And I would love to get more data on how useful it is to people and what parts need to be improved. What are your long-term goals for developing this knowledge bootstrapping process? What I would love to see is a society that is capable of actually seeing long-term challenges coming before they hit critical mass and then responding to them appropriately. There's a whole bunch of problems coming down the pike. Global warming, pandemics were coming down the pike and now they're here. Nuclear weapons never really went away. Open question how dangerous artificial intelligence is. An example that's on my mind right now as someone who lives in California is the ability to do controlled burns so that the wildfires don't get so bad. What are some of the obstacles that prevented us from doing that? If I had to guess, fear of being blamed. Right now, there's no one person to blame for a wildfire. But if you are the dude that set the controlled burn that got out of control, your life is over. There's economic incentives that make it short-term beneficial to be wrong and to very fervently believe the wrong thing. Can you give an example? If I'm an oil company, I really don't want there to be nuclear power. And that extends to not just people working at an oil company, but every senator who has a lot of oil in their state or who has received a lot of money from the oil industry. Let's talk about experts. How do you see the current relationship between lay people and experts? And how do you see that relationship evolving over time? Recording this in the middle of COVID, looking at the CDC is an obvious example. They have reversed themselves on several important things. They are now taking positions that people were yelled at for taking six or eight months ago, such as masks are beneficial. I think what is happening right now is institutions are becoming less trustworthy and people are trusting them less. I think that has pluses and minuses. It was good that people didn't trust the CDC when the CDC said don't wear masks. It's really bad if people don't trust the CDC when the CDC says get your child vaccinated because vaccinations are really important. What I would like is a world where people do more, either do more of their own research or have specific people they have vetted who they trust to do the research who can tell them yes masks but also yes vaccines. There would still be subject matter experts, of course, but people would have more willingness and ability to verify the subject matter experts rather than taking their word for it. A world where people who don't understand things have to take the word on high from an oracle is pretty inimical to what I'm trying to do. Basically, if the truth is something a small select number of people are capable of determining and other people just have to trust them, the system has failed and will explode. Let's imagine a future where everybody is much better at verification, everybody is much more statistically literate, everybody knows how to read a research paper and understand the experimental methodology. What would such a world look like? Oh, that just makes me so happy to even think about. I would love to see more people doing what I do, which is like very deep research and sharing it and it getting more attention. I would like people to be able to ask questions without it being assumed they're rooting for a particular answer or have some ulterior motive other than to learn. All right. Do you have any closing thoughts for our listeners? 
So the single strongest piece of advice I have is come up with your questions before you go looking for answers. The people who are trying to provide answers to questions you haven't asked are hijacking your attention and controlling your agenda. Even though it takes much, much longer, you will ultimately be wiser and better informed if you figure out your questions for yourself. I just want to say this has been an awesome conversation. Oh, thank you. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, so I'd just like to plug my blog, which if you go to elizabethvn.com, will redirect to the much harder to spell URL that I deeply regret but haven't replaced yet. Thanks for having me and thanks for inviting me on.